stupid piece of then I'll You threaten my life, you it's no news that courts are solemn places where the processes of law and justice take place. We all also know that the judges are to be respected and we should conduct ourselves with dignity, but not so for these defendants we are about to see. Their disrespect for the courts and judges will leave you stunned. Here are dumb defendants who forgot there were mics in courtrooms. Jacob Larson. The first dumb defendant on our list is a nasty piece of work. This court session took place in Jackson, Michigan, where the Fourth Circuit Court convened for a hearing on a personal protection order or PPO violation involving Jacob Larson. The defendant was accused of sending unwanted advances via Facebook messages to a woman present, a former high school acquaintance. This conduct was a breach of a restraining order against Larson. The plaintiff recounted numerous messages, many occurring the previous year. The judge probed Larson's frequency of posts, noting this was the second time the defendant faced scrutiny for contact with the plaintiff. Notably, the same judge issued the initial PPO against Larson four months prior. Jail for three days. And the next time you violate it, you're going to jail for... You, you, you know what? Fun. You got a, a bad attitude. You had a bad attitude last time you were in court. Okay? You and her are buddy-buddy. Y'all get along. Y'all are... 45 days county jail. 93 days in the county jail. The judge tried to explain to Larson that his violation of the PPO was getting him a three-day jail sentence, but Larson kept interrupting. Larson insinuated that the judge and the plaintiff were having a relationship. This angered the judge who blasted Larson with 45 days in jail. Larson continued to be disruptive, and the judge increased it to 93 days in jail while daring Larson to make him give more jail time. As the bailiff attempted to cuff Larson in preparation to take him to jail, Larson started to resist. The judge comes around the bench pulling off his robe to join the bailiff in restraining Larson. Larson continues to be belligerent and even throws a few swear words at the judge. The judge and the bailiff succeed in wrestling Larson to the ground where he is put in handcuffs. As he is led away, the judge repeats that Larson is to spend 93 days in the county jail. Face Webb. Webb's heinous actions unfolded in Kentucky from 2003 to 2009, claiming the lives of former girlfriends Brya Runowitz and Sabrina Vaughn. His criminal history dates back to 2000, marked by run-ins with law enforcement. Webb's brutality took the life of Vaughn in 2003, her remains he buried in Powell County. Tragically, Runowitz, aged 31, met a similar fate in Cynthiana Harrison County in 2009. He also targeted a police officer and a correctional officer and attempted murders during the same year. Webb's pattern of violence showed a cold disregard for human life and safety. Our story begins after he tries to murder the police and the correctional officer. During his arraignment in Paris, where he was accused of two counts of attempted murder, he spat on a district court judge, as confirmed by the judge's clerk. Webb appeared in court to confront allegations of attempting to run over Deputy Ryan Barkley and Correctional Officer Josh Mason outside the Bourbon County Jail. Pleading not guilty, Webb engaged in a disturbing display of aggression toward the judiciary. Gail Asbury, clerk to District Judge Vanessa Dixon, disclosed that Judge Dixon withdrew from the case due to her familiarity with Barkley and Mason. Asbury further revealed that Webb retaliated by spitting in Judge Dixon's face. Describing the unsettling episode, Asbury, present in the courtroom at the time, recounted that Webb's actions stemmed from his displeasure with Judge Dixon's decision to step aside. Promptly, deputies intervened, escorting Webb out of the courtroom. But this was not the only time Webb would behave in such a disgusting manner. On February 2, 2011, Bass Webb engaged in a disgusting act at the Fayette County Detention Center, spitting directly into the face of corrections officer Roy Comston. Comston recounted the incident, explaining that it occurred following a search of Webb's cell for contraband. Suspicions arose among jail staff regarding the possible hiding of broken compact discs, potentially to be used as weapons due to their sharp edges. Despite cooperating during the search, with his hands restrained behind his back, Webb's demeanor shifted afterward. Turning towards Comston, he spat out his saliva, striking the officer's forehead and upper nose region. According to Kathy Kearns, the Harrison County clerk, no legal charges were brought against Webb in Harrison County for spitting on the judge. He was not so lucky in the second incident. Webb faced a jury trial where he was found guilty of third-degree assault for spitting at the Fayette County Corrections Officer. The prosecution's case relied on just four witnesses before resting. Webb chose not to testify in his defense, and no witnesses came forward on his behalf. Typically, the trial would proceed to a penalty phase. However, 
Webb opted to forego this phase and instead pleaded guilty to a charge of being a persistent felony offender in the first degree. His decision led to an enhancement of his five-year assault sentence to 10 years. This sentence is to be served alongside a 15-year term for assaulting another Fayette County corrections officer and a 50-year imprisonment for the murder of Briar Runowitz in Harrison County. Alan McCarty Our next defendant on the list took foul mouth to a whole new level. Alan McCarty Jr., 36, a resident of Milton, Florida, known for his profanity-laden tirades, received a severe punishment for his actions. He received 10 days behind bars for his barrage of swear words in court, which nearly resulted in his mouth being taped shut. This was in addition to his conviction in August for threatening Circuit Judge Stasia Warren over a child custody ruling. In that case, he was sentenced to 20 years in prison. Furthermore, Circuit Judge Matt Foxman revealed that McCarty had also menaced a prosecutor's unborn child, triggering a disruptive eruption in the court courtroom. In a stormy scene at the Justice Center in Daytona Beach, Alan McCarty Jr. unleashed a torrent of profanity-laced insults directed at Judge Foxman. Despite Foxman's order for removal, McCarty persisted in his outburst, hurling further swear words at the judge and the assistant state attorney. Deputies were compelled to physically remove him from the courtroom as he adamantly continued his verbal assault, creating a chaotic spectacle. Following his removal from the courtroom, McCarty was relegated to a confined space behind the courtroom, equipped with a speaker for him to hear the proceedings and one-way glass for observation. This was how he had spent the rest of his trial. Despite being separated from the courtroom, his disruptive behavior continued, with his screams reverberating loudly enough to cause the glass to tremble. McCarty's wild conduct underlines the gravity of his offenses as he faced charges of threats of extortion and corruption by threat against a public official stemming from his menacing behavior towards Judge Warren and emergency dispatchers. McCarty's bitterness towards Judge Warren stemmed from his claim of unjust child custody proceedings, despite Warren not presiding over the case. Judge Foxman emphasized this fact, highlighting McCarty's lack of custody rights altogether. Additionally, McCarty's scorn extended to his own assistant public defender, Ryan Bellinger, whom he subjected to curses and insults. Despite McCarty's disruptive behavior, his mother, present in court, chose not to speak, but expressed remorse on behalf of her son. McCarty's outrageous conduct also went into making inappropriate sexual remarks towards Judge Foxman during the trial, including an invitation to engage in oral sex, which the judge firmly declined. Judge Foxman revisited this incident during the sentencing, emphasizing it as part of the contempt of court conviction. Foxman stated that McCarthy offered him to perform a sex act upon McCarthy, which he said he politely declined. The additional 10-day sentence renders McCarty ineligible for placement in a work release or community release center during his prison term. Following his incarceration, he will serve the 10-day county jail sentence. State Attorney R.J. Loritza asserted that McCarty's 20-year sentence allows ample time for him to think about the depth of his actions against the judicial system. Daniel Wright Daniel Wright, 17, smirked, while the grieving mother of Jordan Klee, a student at Pioneer High School that he killed, shed tears. Witnessing this, Judge David S. Swartz paused proceedings, urging prosecutors to reconsider the agreed sentence of 25 to 52 years behind bars. I sincerely hope that whatever it was you wanted so badly that you felt the need to murder my son was worth the next at least 52 years of your continued existence. You won't get the luxury of raising your child because you took mine away. During the sentencing, the judge erased the grin from Wright's face as he faced consequences for the fatal shooting of the high school student. Expressing disbelief at Wright's demeanor, Swartz hinted at his reluctance to accept the plea deal, a departure from his usual approach. The judge warned sternly that as they proceeded to trial, if Wright was convicted of felony murder, he was looking at a life sentence. That means Wright would spend the remainder of his days behind bars. The judge said he was seriously considering such an outcome. Despite the seriousness of the situation, Wright wore a smile and shook his head, seemingly buoyed by support from a companion in the courtroom. Meanwhile, Klee's grandfather, tearful mother Karen Klee, and her cousin shared their victim impact statements. They reminisced about the pioneer high school student's passion for sports, the milestones like prom and holidays he'll never experience, and the profound grief they've endured since his tragic demise. Karen Klee lamented that this year was meant to be filled with celebrations. Instead, it became a nightmare. She further stated that on the rare nights she manages to sleep, she hears her son cry for her. Your Honor, my client wants to address the court. Oh, of course. To... Yes, sir. Mr. Wright, what would you like to say? I just want to tell y'all, I'll be home soon. I'll be Keon. I love my family.
During his opportunity to address the court, Wright expressed a simple desire for the acceptance of his plea and sentence agreement, hoping to return home swiftly. He conveyed affection for his family and offered a R.I.P. Keon, a probable reference to the 2014 suspected gang-related shooting death of Keon Washington. However, his demeanor shifted noticeably when Assistant Washtenaw County Prosecuting Attorney John Vela requested time to confer with the Klee family regarding the plea deal. Following an extensive break, Vela disclosed that the family preferred Swartz to proceed with the agreement, aiming to open the door for closure and embark on the path toward forgiveness. David Goldstein, Wright's attorney, sought understanding for his client's demeanor, attributing the smiles to a blend of fear, youthfulness, and behavioral challenges. The judge, swayed by the family's desire for closure, reluctantly accepted the plea deal, sentencing Wright to 23 to 50 years. Despite concerns about his inappropriate demeanor, Wright avoided more severe charges in connection with other gang-related activities. However, the sentencing wasn't without controversy. Prosecutors argued Wright's ties to the finesse gang, evidenced by a rap mentioning gang deaths and a letter referencing a gang member, should be considered. Emotions ran high during Wright's sentencing. While prosecutors argued his gang involvement should factor in, Wright denied ties and claimed the rap lyrics were fiction. The judge ultimately included both perspectives in the report. Wright's mother maintained his innocence and highlighted his mental health struggles, believing they weren't adequately addressed. She expressed sympathy for the Klee family while also grieving her loss. Tobias Roman Moving to Bakersfield, California to the arraignment of Tobias Roman aka Giggles, the 27-year-old faced a slew of charges, including attempted robbery, making terroristic threats, and brandishing a deadly weapon. His alleged actions involved stalking a female mall employee, which prompted legal action. The bailiff instructed Roman to stand, but he initially refused, setting a rocky tone for his hearing. Judge Charles Bamer intervened, commanding Roman to stand, to which he finally complied. With Roman on his feet, the judge proceeds to ask a routine procedural inquiry. The judge questioned Mr. Roman seeking his accurate name. While Giggles might be the moniker he used in the streets, the weight of the charges levied against him removed any hint of humor. Judge Charles Bamer proceeded by appointing the public defender to represent Mr. Roman. Addressing Roman, the judge outlined the charges, primarily attempted robbery. However, interruptions started as Giggles attempted to interject, prompting the judge to assert authority and instructing Roman to maintain silence. Following more interruptions and a directive for silence, Judge Charles Bamer issued a stern final warning to the defendant. He emphasized that this is the last opportunity for him to behave himself. The judge warned that failure to behave properly would result in Giggles' removal from proceedings. The judge presented this as a choice, stressing the seriousness of the situation. Initially, there was a fleeting moment where it seemed Giggles might comply and quieten down. However, this break was brief as he persisted in addressing the judge. Consequently, the judge instructed Giggles to leave the courtroom. Despite being escorted out, Giggles managed to mutter a menacing remark. He said under his breath that he was going to murder the judge when next he saw the judge as deputies led him away. The judge, fully aware of the severity of the statement, took note of it without hesitation. Addressing the court, Judge Charles Bamer requested that Giggles' menacing statement be officially documented. He focused on the seriousness of Giggles' threat, stating that he openly declared his intent to murder him if they were to cross paths. The judge emphasized the need for law enforcement to take decisive action in response to this serious threat, ensuring the safety and security of all involved parties. Subsequently, Giggles entered a plea of no contest specifically to the charge of threatening a public official, resulting in an eight-month prison sentence. Remarkably, all other charges against him were dismissed, save for the offense of threatening with intent to terrorize. Giggles once again pleaded no contest to this remaining charge, leading to a separate sentencing of three years in prison. These legal developments culminated in him facing the consequences of his actions. Bryce Rhodes Triple murder suspect and rapper Bryce Rhodes, a.k.a. Rambo, was wild with his courtroom disruptions, directing threats at Louisville Judge Charles Cunningham. Rhodes, alleging racial bias from his legal team, unleashed profanity during a pretrial session. He contended that Louisville Metro Police are fabricating evidence against him in connection to the May 2016 killings of Larry Ordway and Morris Gordon, discovered stabbed and burned in a West Louisville residence. In addition, Rhodes faced charges for the shooting death of Christopher Jones. Just do your job, not to worry about me. That's what I'm saying. Well, I worry about me. You worry about yourself. You're not trying to give me a fair chance, effective counsel. Well, 
Who, who do you who do you think oh, I should give okay. you as a lawyer? I'll write the bar association and the ACLU. They're going to find out, though. They're going to find out real quick. Facing the death penalty, Bryce Rhodes was seeking a new attorney for at least the third time. Accusing two Louisville homicide detectives of fabricating testimony and perjury, he confronted Judge Cunningham, alleging unfair treatment and ineffective counsel. Disregarding Cunningham's attempts to discuss attorney representation challenges, Rhodes exploded with frustration. He admonished the judge to focus on himself. Rhodes ominously warned of impending revelations, promising Cunningham would soon understand. Discussion of the Bryce Rhodes case inevitably involves courtroom events, particularly concerning his representation by attorney Brendan McLeod. McLeod found himself in a conflict of interest when he discovered that the victims, Larry and Maurice, were grandchildren of a close friend. Consequently, McLeod recused himself from the case. Rhodes, upon learning this, reportedly reacted unfavorably. Allegedly, he spat on McLeod, indicating his displeasure with the decision. Later in court, when McLeod formally recused himself from Rhodes's case, he proposed to the judge that he be kept separate from Rhodes to prevent them from getting into a fight. McLeod and Rhodes engaged in a verbal exchange during this process. Rhodes sarcastically taunted McLeod, calling him a coward, to which McLeod responded with a dismissive remark. Rhodes then issued a menacing threat, declaring that he would confront McLeod upon his release. He was forced to wear a mask in court after this incident. Furthermore, Rhodes accused a judge of KKK membership. He also alleged an inappropriate relationship between the judge and the prosecution. Delays in the trial stemmed partly from concerns about Rhodes's competency due to his mental health and intellectual disability history. Jefferson County Circuit Court Judge Julie Kalin determined Rhodes unfit for the death penalty but competent for trial and a potential life sentence in October. Despite apprehensions about Rhodes's courtroom conduct, he remained composed during the trial, prompting the judge to forego implementing a stun cuff as a precaution against future outbursts. After more than seven years since the drive-by shooting that claimed a man's life and led to the subsequent stabbing deaths of two teenage brothers, the Kentucky rapper Bryce Rhodes, 33, faced conviction for the three murders. The trial in Louisville centered on the May 2016 killings of Christopher Jones, a 40-year-old father of two, alongside 14-year-old Larry Ordway and 16-year-old Maurice Gordon. Prosecutors in Jefferson County asserted that Rhodes mistakenly targeted Jones, believing he had a bounty on his head, and later eliminated Ordway and Gordon to silence potential witnesses. These tragic events unfolded within weeks of each other, leaving a trail of devastation in their wake. Isaiah Gardenhire in Mount Pleasant, Michigan, Isaiah Gardenhire, age 40, faces arraignment following a harrowing two-day crime spree that sent shockwaves through the community. Accused of sexually assaulting his girlfriend before fatally attacking her 13-year-old daughter, Gardenhire then allegedly took hostages at a nearby apartment complex. Reports indicate he sexually assaulted the female hostage, robbed the victims, and stole their vehicle. Although Gardenhire eventually surrendered to authorities, during Judge Sarah Spencer Nogle's reading of the extensive charges, he appears disengaged, even dozing off. The list of accusations against him included homicide, sexual assault, and weapon use, painting a harsh picture of his alleged crimes. As the court proceedings unfolded, Gardenhire continued displaying signs of disinterest, audibly yawning, and drawing attention away from the hearing. However, the judge remained focused and directed the prosecuting attorney, David Barberi, to discuss Gardenhire's bond conditions. Barberi emphasized the magnitude of Gardenhire's criminal past, which includes a history of violent and weapons-related offenses, as well as prior instances of failing to appear in court. Furthermore, Barberi highlighted that Gardenhire was already out on bond for a separate criminal sexual misconduct case in another county when he allegedly embarked on the two-day crime spree. In this complex case, Gardenhire faces charges of murder while being on bond at the time of the alleged offenses. As the prosecutor begins discussing the charges, Gardenhire interjects, asserting that his girlfriend, not him, should be held responsible for the murder of her daughter. Interrupting the prosecutor mid-sentence, he insists that they charge her with murder because she's the one who did it. The prosecutor attempts to redirect, but Gardenhire persists, prompting a warning from the court. Judge Sarah Spencer Nogle warns Gardenhire that his microphone will be muted if he speaks out of turn again. All right, thank you. Mr. Barbary, Mr. Gardenhire, I'm going to ask that you behave in a... All right. I'm going to ask you behave in a manner that's appropriate for a court proceeding, particularly given the fact that right now I'm considering 
whether or not to allow your release on bond. If I have any more acting out, sir, we're going to turn off your audio and your... Despite ceasing his interruptions, Gardenhire resorts to flashing a profane hand gesture, prompting the judge to intervene. Judge Sarah Spencer Nogle admonishes him, stressing the need for him to behave himself, especially as his bond status is under consideration. Warning of consequences for further disruptions, the judge ultimately orders Gardenhire's audio and video to be muted due to his continued misconduct. After further deliberation on his bond conditions, Gardenhire was brought back into the discussion, but appeared even more disinterested than before, indicating a lack of concern for the situation he was in. After considering the criteria outlined in the case law, the court deemed a $3 million cash or surety bond appropriate. However, Gardenhire's behavior took a disrespectful turn as he flips the judge the bird, first with one hand and then with both. Judge Spencer Nogle swiftly responds by instructing them to turn off his video feed. The hearing was abruptly halted due to Gardenhire's misconduct. Isaiah Gardenhire remains incarcerated on a $1.3 million bond, facing a total of 12 criminal charges, including home invasion, first-degree criminal sexual misconduct, and murder. Milton Watts. For this next one, we step into the Berea Municipal Court. There, 21-year-old Milton Watts surrendered after a warrant for his arrest due to a missed court appearance on a domestic violence charge. Questioned by Judge Chris Green about his absence, Watts cited his mother's failure to appear and a family member's death as reasons. The judge shot back that the court summons were not a suggestion. Watts appears unfazed by the situation, he decided to handle it independently after his attorney withdrew. Informed by the judge that he needs to hire a new attorney, Watts insists he doesn't require legal representation. When asked if he is a lawyer, Watts responds negatively, revealing his limited understanding of the legal process. The judge attempts to discuss bail, but Watts appears unaware of its significance. Frustrated, Judge Green asks if Watts wants to discuss bail, to which Watts gives a shocking reply that includes a swear word. Judge Green, known for his straightforward approach, is unimpressed by Watts's attitude, signaling potential trouble ahead. Facing contempt of court, Watts is sentenced to 30 days in county jail, swiftly handcuffed. However, a chance for bail arises, set at $5,000 cash for a charity bond under a temporary protection order. Despite already facing consequences, Watts further aggravates the situation by swearing at the judge. Advised to choose wisely between cooperation and resistance, Watts defiantly swears again, inviting further punishment. The judge, unmoved, threatens a longer sentence, asking if Watts desires a 90-day term instead of 60. You can either make life easy or you can make life hard. I already ruined my life. That's 60. You want to go for 90? That's 90 more. Watts' outburst continues, prompting the judge to add 90 more days to his sentence. At that moment, it seems like a dam broke in his mouth, and Watts unleashes a torrent of profanities, each increasing his punishment. The judge sternly announces an additional 180 days, then doubles it to 360. Despite his sister's plea to cease, Watts persists, taunting the judge about his escalating sentence. Undeterred, the judge confirms the tally, prompting Watts to sarcastically remark about his impending year-long incarceration. Efforts from Watts' mother and sister proved futile as he persisted in his profanity-loaded rant, displaying an unyielding defiance. Despite pleas to stop, Watts continued to spew obscenities, expressing disdain for authority and society. Court personnel swiftly intervened as tensions escalated, yet Watts remained unrepentant, declaring his stance against the establishment. Even faced with a potential 360-day sentence, Watts remained steadfast in his behavior. After calming down, the judge reduced the sentence to 90 days, equating it to four days for each profane word uttered. Ultimately, Watts pleaded no contest to the initial domestic violence charge, receiving a separate five-day sentence in jail. Austin Boone In Jefferson District Courtroom 203, Austin Boone, 20, faced contempt charges and received a seven-day jail sentence for removing his pants during the proceedings. Boone had attended court to address allegations of speeding 22 miles above the limit and possessing drug paraphernalia. The entire incident unfolded on courtroom video. During the trial, Jefferson District Judge Stephanie Pierce Burke inquired about Boone's plea preference, to which he deferred to his defense attorney's guidance. Boone expressed uncertainty, stating he forgot whether his attorney told him to say guilty or not guilty. Judge Burke clarified, offering the benefits of pleading guilty following their previously discussed plea agreement. Burke clarified that the agreement entailed a guilty plea, offering Boone a $1.44 fine for speeding 
and a $100 fine for drug possession. Additionally, he could opt for traffic school, avoiding six points on his license. Including court expenses, his total owed amounted to $178. However, as the judge finalizes the details and a payment of $178 looms, a bailiff notices a glaring issue with Boone's courtroom attire, his sagging pants. The bailiff promptly brings the matter to Judge Burke's attention. As Boone prepared to depart, the judge issued an instruction, reminding him to pull up his pants before leaving the courtroom. While some courtroom observers found the sight of Boone's sagging pants amusing, Judge Burke remained stern. She reminded Boone that he was in a court. He acknowledges and says yes. Judge Burke asserts that he was to do what the judge said. The judge once again ordered him to pull his pants up around his waist. Boone sought clarification, asking what she wanted him to do. Judge Burke insists that he pull his pants up, even if he had to tighten his belt. She told him he had to be an adult when he came to court. Boone agreed, but stated he was trying to leave. The judge warned him that failure to pull up his pants could result in a prolonged stay. Boone insisted that they are up, and he is then instructed to take a seat by Judge Burke. However, the judge's patience wears thin when Boone is called back before her 15 minutes later. She asserted her authority, emphasizing she instructed him to pull his pants up on several occasions. Instead of rectifying the situation, he opted to remove his pants, showing a lack of respect for the court. Removing your pants was extremely poor judgment. Okay, I'm holding you in contempt. I'm going to sentence you to seven days to serve for direct contempt of court. Boone is shocked, but the judge is not moved, sentencing him to seven days for direct contempt of court. Ultimately, Boone spends two days in jail for contempt, while his original charges of speeding and possession of drug paraphernalia result in attending traffic school and paying fines as per his plea agreement. Ebony Burks. In a video that has since gone viral, a woman hilariously talks her way into a 300-day jail time for contempt of court. Appearing via video feed in Elyria Municipal Court, Ohio, Ebony Burks, aged 32, faced accusations of domestic violence and assault. Accused of misdemeanor assault and domestic violence against her grandfather, Shadrach McCray, and his companion, Ebony Burks appeared before Judge Gary Bennett in the courtroom. As the proceedings commenced, Judge Bennett greeted Miss Burks and presented her with the options for her plea, guilty, not guilty, or no contest. Choosing to plead not guilty, Burks expressed her concern about the condition of her bond, set at $155,000, which prohibited her from contacting the victims. She contested the restriction, citing her residency in her grandfather's house. At this juncture, it's customary for a lawyer to step in to ease off the tensions, but this bond hearing was far from the norm. Ebony Burks, adamant about accessing her residence, expressed frustration. The judge's response continued to be insistent that she could not return to the home. Burks' continued protest angered the judge. He then declared her in contempt, threatening 30 days imprisonment. As tensions escalated with Burke still resisting, he gave her another 30-day sentence, totaling 60 days. As Ebony Burks persisted in arguing and adopting an aggressive tone towards the judge, he incrementally escalated the duration of her prison sentence. From 90 days, it extended to 120 days, then to 180 days. Amid the courtroom tension, Burke's defiance intensified, leading to physical resistance and further verbal confrontation. Nothing. We'll talk in six months when you're ready to come back for your case. All right, Alan. That's 200 days. You got anything else to say, Ms. Burks? you. That's 300 days. The judge remained composed as he pronounced additional days of imprisonment, reaching a total of 200 days. Despite the escalating penalties, Burks continued her outburst, culminating in a swear word directed at the judge. In response, he delivered the harshest sentence in the court's history, 300 days of contempt, reflecting how bad the situation had gotten. Which of these dumb defendants do you find the most disrespectful? Tell us all about it in the comments section. For videos just as captivating as his one, click on one of the cards appearing on your screen now.